Welcome to That's Good Sports. I am Brandon. Nobody recaps football slower than me, Perna. Today, I will break down the NFC North in its second part. I'm doing the Bears and Vikings off-season additions and de departures via the draft and free agency. Now, I posted the Packers and Lions episode uh, two weeks ago. So at this rate, I will get through every division by the end of 2021. My apologies for the delay. I know some of you were asking when the hell I would get to this episode. I said it would be up two weeks ago, but here we are. Now, in the present moment, it is coming into your fucking face. Let's get sports. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. I do football news videos here. Uh, sometimes they take a while, like this one, and other times when a guy gets arrested or Nick Wright predicts the Broncos to go 3-13, and I, I get them up quickly. But I do football. Also, it was a lot of fun talking with everyone on Patreon who joined the Zoom meeting, the exclusive Zoom Patreon meeting. Uh, it was great talking to you guys, except for Gary. You really weirded us out, Gary. You sick son of a bitch, Gary. <laughs> but uh, nonetheless, you can support this channel, patreon.com slash that's good sports. And I have big dick Patreon shout outs for new patrons. Available to be diversity hire, unpaid intern, hashtag come get me, hashtag trust season, hashtag, hashtag. Steve, it's Vaughn like Donkey Kong tar upping to $15. Keith Anderson, also upping to $15. David Munoz, Lil Baby Chihuahua Bitch Dog Gage Handjobson, FKA Mr. 10,000 IQ, upping to $5. Aaron from West Virginia, Jory Cones, Bills Mafia Loves You. Thank you, Bills Mafia. I love you too. Magoo with a massive, giant, humongous cock donation of $50. Thank you, Magoo. Kai and Lonnie Garcia. Thank you guys so much for your donations. Oh my God, thank you. Okay, let's start with the Chicago Bears. The Bears set themselves up perfectly to compete five years ago between their choices in free agency and their lack of first round draft picks and their lack of direction. A lack of direction that can only be matched by the LA Rams design department. Sorry in advance, Adam Rank. Chicago was perfect last season though at eight and eight, four and four at home, four and four on the road with one bullshit win against the Broncos. The Bears were not bad enough to shame and not good enough to praise. Again, the perfect place to be as an NFL franchise, especially when you're wondering if your bisky is indeed true. Now the Bears free agent uh, key losses and signings were, they, were these. <laughs> the Bears lost a few important players on defense like Leonard Floyd, Prince Amukamara, Nick Kawasaki, Haha uh, -ha Clinton Dix, and eventually on offense, Lawrence Godfrey Burton III, AKA Trey Burton, who signed with the Colts, who actually got him for pennies. In fact, I think Colts GM Chris Ballard is so savvy, he convinced Trey Burton to pay the Colts to play. First player to pay to play since Vontae Davis quit at halftime and had to give all of his signing bonus back to the Bills. Instead, the Bears opted to pay older players like my very own Danny Trevathan, Robert Quinn, who they paid $70 million, and Artie Burns, who's likely maybe just a little bit of a downgrade from Prince of Mukamara. I mean, Burns has famously been a key member of a terrible Steeler secondary and was hurt most of 2019, but I get what they see in him. He is young at 25 and did have an impressive rookie season back in 2016 with three picks and 65 combined tackles and a sane Antonio Brown on the Steelers offense. They also poached offensive line help from the Seattle Seahawks and tackled Jermaine Afidi, which is like trying to stay healthy by touching all of the toilet seats at your local hospital with your tongue. On offense, the Bears added Nick Foles to compete with Mitch Trubisky. And whichever one wins gets to throw to Ted Ginn and Jimmy Graham. A bunch of gin and a few grams is what most Bears fans will need to make it through the season. My official prediction. Might as well throw in uh, Dallas Clark and Percy Harvin. Uh, Graham was their choice 
when Chicago lost a bidding war for tight end Austin Hooper, which is like going to Chick-fil-A on a Sunday, realizing it's closed, and eating expired chicken from the back of your freezer. What doesn't kill you only gives you foodborne illness, which is how I imagine Bears fans again will feel every time they hear the names Watson and Mahomes for all eternity. Bears fans have also justifiably ridded all public libraries of any Sherlock Holmes books. It sounds too much like Mahomes and Watson and is a reminder of the one case their team can't solve, quarterback. Now the Bears draft grade, collectively, they get a pass, a passing grade. I won't fault them for not having a first round pick because it turned into their best player, but the rest of the draft was a little bit questionable outside of Jalen Johnson. Uh, key players drafted, again, they didn't have a first rounder with the Khalil Mack trade, but they did have an extra second round pick from Oakland. So they took Cole Kemet, Cole Kemet, tight end out of Notre Dame and Jalen Johnson. Again, corner out of Utah, both in the second. Uh, they have so many tight ends already that the Kemet pick is a little weird in a notoriously weak tight end draft class. But Jalen Johnson was a great value pick at 50th overall, and as long as he's healthy, he should be a stud. They had no third or fourth round picks, but in the fifth, they had three picks and got edge rusher Travis Gibson out of Tulsa and Georgia Southern corner Kendall Vildor, a minor character from season three of Game of Thrones, and Darnell Mooney, wide receiver from Tulane. I will give them a dab for the late selection of Lachavius Simmons with pick 227. Lachavius unless it's Lachavius, but I think it's Lachavius, and I am ashamed to have let that name slip through the That's Good Sports cracks and not make it into the best named player episode. It is a glorious name. Now, do they still have a good quarterback? That's what I'm basing every team's success on, and the, the question is, we don't know. Mitch Trubisky struggled, and the fact that he's not Deshaun Watson or Patrick Mahomes hurts him, but what about Nick Foles? who was injured most of the year in Jacksonville. What about him? When he did play, however, in Jacksonville, he was 0-4 with pedestrian numbers. Sure, that's Jacksonville, but is the situation in Chicago much better? Offensively, I don't know. On the defensive side of the ball, I would say yes, but Foles is only 5-11 in 16 games outside of Philadelphia. But the Bears do have a secret weapon, and I stand by my stance, which isn't just redundant, it is accurate. And that secret weapon is Matt Nagy. If he's as good as I still believe he is, he will start the season with Mitch Trubisky and then bench him between weeks two and eight, depending on how big Foles is in the jock. Once at full capacity, unleash Foles from the bench to carry the Bears into the playoffs where anything can happen. Just ask the Vikings. Before I give my final grade though for the Bears, let me bring in renowned Bears fan Adam Rank from the NFL Network to give you reason to believe the wind in the windy city will carry the Bears into the postseason instead of its traditional symbolism of just indicating they, like the wind, also blow. What's up everybody, your favorite Chicago Bears fan right here telling you why the monsters of the Midway will be better that a lot of people are giving them credit for. That defense last year that people thought was bad was actually a top 10 defense. They were top five in scoring. Now you have a full season of Akeem Hicks. He's healthy, he's ready to go. You got Khalil Mack running alongside of Robert Quinn now instead of Leonard Floyd. Robert Quinn had 11 and a half sacks last season for the Dallas Cowboys. That is going to be a significant upgrade over Leonard Floyd. I feel like they stole Jalen Johnson in the draft, that is a first round talent that they are bringing in. And of course, Deshaun Gibson, that is a great player. You can pair him there with Eddie Jackson. Let Jackson play more of the free high safety. Put him in a position where he is going to excel. This defense is going to be great. The big question is the offense. What is going to happen? And to me, it all comes down to the offensive line. If Castile can come in there and revamp that offensive line. You keep Cody Whitehair at the center position like he should have been all year last year. And if you can get some production, you can get some cohesion from that offensive line and have the ability to run the football, the Bears are going to be much better because no matter who the quarterback is, whether it's Mitch Trubisky or Nick Foles, they're going to need to be able to establish the run. They're going to have to have the threat of the run. And if they do that, if they just get replacement level play from the quarterback position, 
In my mind, they don't win less than 10 games. I'm trying to be conservative. I'm trying to say, hey, let's be cool. 10 and six, but you know what? My heart's trying to tell me 12 and four, but you know what? To keep it realistic so people don't think I'm a homer, I'm gonna say 10 and six, but this Bears team is gonna be better because of that defense. Now my overall arbitrary grade for the Bears, four out of 10 inches. A guy I'm watching is Riley Ridley. Knowing he had exactly 69 receiving yards in 2019, nobody is more poised to turn his stats upside down and go hog wild this year than Ridley. Now the Vikings, moving on to the Vikings. That's what Vikings do, right? Now the Vikings finished 10 and six last season and lost in the divisional round of the playoffs to the eventual Super Bowl losing 49ers. The good news for the Vikings is that due to the stay at home orders, I have finally jumped into the hit series Vikings and can now reference Ragnar, Rolo, Floki, Lagertha, and Blood Eagles with a deep, deep understanding. The big move, the big off season move was clearly trading Stefan Diggs to the Bills, but the fact that they got more than the Texans did for DeAndre Hopkins is a testament to how much Bill O'Brien is not their GM. The Vikings then cut to Xavier where we're going, we don't need Rhodes, who went to Indy, and then both uh, Trey Waynes and Mackenzie Alexander thought they would have kept one. Uh, both of them went to the Bengals. They also lost their safety, Andrew Sandejo, to the Browns. Sandejo choosing the Browns over the Vikings finally makes him a real Pendejo. <laughs> Minnesota will more than make up for it uh, if they can extend Anthony Harris, who's currently franchise tagged. Harris and Harrison are close to, if not the best safety tandem since, since me and Phil Ross ran our junior safety patrol in middle school. Do you have a hall pass to be out here? Huh? Nobody got more action than the guys in safety patrol. <laughs> now the corners uh, will consist of Mike Hughes, Holton Hill, and probably a bunch of rookies. At the very least, they got a lot younger in the secondary, all of which will be closely watched by Lizzo. That said, their biggest question mark, still corner. Now their draft grade uh, I'm going to give them is success by mathematical probability. They said, here are our needs and took care of said needs and collectively had A grades by more draft graders than any other team. Either all of those guys are right, or the Vikings are cursed, which if you know anything about Viking folklore and pagan rituals is very plausible. If there is a curse, the Vikings must keep Kirk Cousins for nine seasons and then make nine human sacrifices to shed the curse. Now the key players they drafted came with their first two picks. They clearly needed help at corner and wide receiver, so they got a corner and a wide receiver. Imagine, imagine that, drafting with logic. Both in the first round, uh, the Diggs pick turned into Justin Jefferson from LSU, the best slot receiver outside of Jerry Judy, and then they traded down and grabbed Jeff Gladney, corner out of TCU with the 31st pick. The Vikings entered the draft with the most picks, but then in the third round, they traded with the Saints. Wait, no, I said that wrong. They robbed the desperate Saints of four picks with the third round trade. Minnesota added 15 players through the draft in total. Minnesota turned their third round compensatory pick into fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh round picks, which turned into picks James Lynch, Harrison Hand, Blake Brandle, and Nate Stanley. One of which will be the sole reason the Saints lose again to the Vikings in the postseason. And Drew Brees will wonder why he tied himself to the fate of a Christian God instead of the many Viking gods, including the almighty Odin. Odin, probably the name of another one of the fucking players the Vikings drafted. So, the big question, do the Vikings still have a good quarterback? They do still have a good quarterback. Not a great quarterback, but definitely a pretty dang good quarterback. Kirk Cousins got an extension from the Vikings, which will keep him in Minnesota until 2022, even though zero of his salary is guaranteed in 2022. What I'm curious though, is to see how well the Vikings offense functions after losing coordinator and part-time male model Kevin Stefanski to the Browns. As someone who knows Gary Kubiak's offense very well, I think you need the injection of creativity from guys like Stefanski to make it work like it did in 2019. I love Kubes, but I think some of his offensive philosophies date back to the actual time Vikings ruled the Northern Seas. 
I love the draft pick of LSU wide receiver Justin Jefferson to replace Diggs' production. Uh, if he's not ready to go, though, as a rookie, watch out for Colorado's own Ola B.C. Johnson to have a breakout second year, or son of Don Beebe, Chad, who averaged 35 yards a catch with his two receptions in 2019. You come here for the elite wide receiver stats I dig up, don't you? Now my off-season grade or score for the Vikings it's three skulls in one new wooden boat. Your secret weapon, Minnesota, is Britton Colquitt. That signing will pay off in the long run. And if offensive lineman Ezra Cleveland is as good as many believe he will be in the NFL, that might be the sleeper pick of the draft to help a slowly improving offensive line. If I am forced to make a prediction, I think the Vikings will win the division. I think they got a little bit better. While the Bears feel like they stayed about the same and the Packers will take a step back after having a season where they really overperformed or outperformed with the overall talent they had on the roster and we know they did nothing to upgrade that. But I say that cautiously because you could argue that Aaron Rodgers and Matt LaFleur in their second season together take a big leap forward. The Lions and Bears could swap spots as the worst and best average team in the division, but I think two teams from the NFC North make the playoffs, and I think that will be the Vikings and the Packers. No surprises here. Thanks for watching another episode of That's Good Sports. I promise I'll be more timely with the rest of the divisional recaps as this weird, weird football offseason moves forward. Twitter, Instagram, at Brandon Perna if you want to talk shit to me there.